Okay, guys, we're going to continue on in chapter one. Um, when we last left off, we were talking about socioeconomic factors that influence infectious disease and chronic disease. Um, I wanted you to also pay particular attention to the section entitled The Changing Specter of Infectious Diseases that talks a little bit about pandemic what a pandemic is, and we are in the midst of that, of course, with COVID-19. So check that out, please. And so where I wanna kind of pick up next is that section of chapter one that talks about historical foundations. And so hopefully we're at that slide. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So the field of microbiology, um, you know, we can, we can go back several hundred years to some of the scientists that began to contribute to our knowledge of microorganisms and the role they play in infection. We're gonna talk a little bit about that next. Um, and we're gonna focus on these four bulleted items that kind of describe some of the major milestones in this field of microbiology. Although I guess we could apply these to other branches of biology as well. One very common mode of thinking, even among noted academicians back in the 14th and 15th century and even into the 16th and 17th century, is this theory referred to or this type of thinking um, that espouses to what is referred to as spontane spontaneous generation, which means that life arises from non-life. It was thought for many, many hundreds of years that if, for example, you took some old rags and threw them in the corner of your house, and a couple of days later, you lifted those rags up and you found some rats, Underneath the, rat, underneath the rags. But the reason that the rats were there was because they came from those rags that laid in the corner of the, of the house. I mean, it sounds kind of bizarre to us today, but people at, at that time were making merely observations and drawing some erroneous conclusions upon, based upon those observations. People used to think that there was this, this vital force present in the air, in water, that was this contributing factor that gave rise to living things. That they came from non-living things. It is, again, a very bizarre sort of way of thinking when we talk about it today. But at that time, that was what most people thought including many smart professors of major universities espoused to this notion of spontaneous generation. We'll come back to that in just a moment, but let's talk about a couple um, historical figures at the time that laid the groundwork for our present day knowledge of science. And this first fellow by the name of Van Leeuwenhoek was a Dutch clothier who lived in the middle part of the 17th century. And so his job was, was selling linens. But when he wasn't in the front selling merchandise, he would retire to his workroom and for some reason became interested in looking at objects using some lenses that he actually hand ground himself. These small little single lenses, that's what he started with, kind of like a magnifying glass, you all know what that is. And he started looking at, at objects and he got more sophisticated in his ability to hand grind lenses to increase the magnification. And he saw all these amazing things. Initially, he could get up to about 300 times actual size, which is pretty significant if you think about a single lens. And this fellow looking through this thing and in, in you know, 1672, 
But as a result of his work, he began to make sketches and observations, and he actually became quite um, famous in scientific circles as a result of these sketches and documents that he, that he published. And people began to pay much attention to him. Uh, he, he became pretty well known, actually. And he called these little things that he was sketching animalcules, which means tiny animals. So on the right-hand side of this slide, you see some of the sketches that Van Leeuwenhoek took back in the 1700s. Um, we recognize these today as bacteria. Yeah. He didn't know what bacteria were. He just saw these structures that had varying shapes to them, and he sketched them and he described them. This is a, repl a replica of Van Leeuwenhoek's primitive cam uh, camera microscope that he eventually designed. So here's that single lens that he, he hand ground in his workshop. And he put that drop of blood or the drop of semen or the drop of pond water on the tip of this little specimen holder. And then he was able to, as a result of turning these different screws, position that drop of specimen in such a way that when he looked through the lens, he could see it. So here's an individual kind of looking through that lens, looking at that pond water, looking at that blood, whatever it might have been. He looked at all sorts of things. And uh, there's a YouTube video here I'd like you to watch that talks more about Van Leeuwenhoek. I think you'll find it interesting. It's a nice, a nice synopsis of his work. So check it out. In addition to the early microscopes back in the 1600s, starting with Van Leeuwenhoek and then more and more technology involved the development of more sophisticated sorts of microscopes. But in addition to microscopy, the formation of the scientific method as a way of learning about how the world worked came to be. We know it today as a mechanism that all scientists use as they attempt to explain some natural phenomenon that they've observed. Now think back to ANP1, a lot of you took that here at JCC, we performed an experiment whereby we walked you through the steps of the scientific method, if you remember. That was the lab that involved predicting height based upon long bone lengths. We chose either the femur or the humerus or whatever the bone may have been, depending upon what lab you were in. Uh, and it, it really is a, a fairly simplistic um, experiment, but it does walk one through this process. One of the most important steps, of course, of the scientific method is the formation of what's referred to as a hypothesis. This if-then statement, this prediction that we make that is then tested, right? And then we analyze the data, we look at the results, and we draw conclusions based upon that experiment that was done. Ultimately, we need to revisit the hypothesis and ask ourselves, did the data support it? Or did the data not support the hypothesis? And more times than not, the data does not support that educated guess. And we have to reject it. And what do we have to do next? Do you remember? We have to ask a new question. We have to make a new prediction. We have to develop a new hypothesis, which is then tested. And if you do that enough times and you, add, and you come up with good hypotheses, because you're learning, learning, you're learning more and more about that topic, whatever it is that you're studying, pretty soon it's peer reviewed, people read the article, that you publish perhaps, they try to replicate it, if they get the same results you do, it just adds more um, validity to that particular topic that you're studying, that particular problem you're, you're, you're trying to, to look at or, or um, about, um, work out, if you will. So the formation of the scientific method is a really, really important process that people began to utilize rather than this sort of observational science. They were trying to base it on observable, testable 
conclusions. Okay. This particular individual was one of the first to challenge spontaneous generation theory, which remember says that life comes from non-life. And he devised this fairly simplistic experiment that looked at the relationship between rotting meat and flies. Now, many, many years ago, even to this day, I guess, if you put you know, rotten meat or whatever out in the backyard in the summertime, within a few days, you'll see maggots on the surface of that meat and eventually the maggots will pupate into flies. So the observation was, flies come from rotting meat. A, a fair observation to make. Not a fair conclusion to say that flies emerge as a result of rotting meat. But what Reddy did was he took some meat, he placed it in a jar over the top of which he placed this linen. And he discovered after a few days that there were the maggots here on the top of the linen, of the lid of the jar. This is open to the air. And eventually those maggots pupated into flies. So the maggots don't necessarily need the meat, if you will, to develop. The adult flies are simply attracted to the meat. They would have laid their eggs in it had they, had they been able to do that, but the, the linen, of course, prevented that. So the maggots formed on the surface. So there wasn't this vital force in the meat that gave rise to flies. We know today that the flies lay their eggs on the meat so that when the eggs hatch, the larvae have a protein source, right? We know that. But they can develop and form, the maggots can, without having access to the protein in the meat, as evidenced by Reddy's experiment. So he began to challenge this idea that life comes from non-life. In other words, you had to have, li had to have living adult flies before you're going to eventually have maggots and the next generation of flies. The meat is simply there, as we know today, as a protein source, but is not the source of the flies. One would assume that this may have put this notion of spontaneous generation to bed, but it didn't. Abiogenesis continued to be a common mode of thinking, even after Reddy's experiment. Another individual that came around at this time to explore this question of spontaneous generation was John Needham. He was an Englishman. And what Needham did was he, he sort of um, provided, not purposefully, but his experiment actually began to sort of give a little bit of evidence to spontaneous generation. In fact, he wanted to prove that this indeed could happen. So what he did was he took a container that had chicken broth inside, that had bacteria growing in it. He boiled that, spent that uh, chicken broth until it was clear. And he assumed that there were no living cells in there because it went from cloudy to clear. And then some days later, he looked at his container again and he discovered it was cloudy, thus indicating the presence of some cells, which we know, of course, are bacteria. So what Needham said was that in this air that was open at the top, so he had another piece of linen here or something on top that allowed air to get in and out, he said that there was a life force in the air that entered down into the container and was the source for the resulting cells that developed in the broth after a few days. Even though it was, he thought, presumably sterile, after a couple of days when this 
This life force got in. It resulted in life coming from non-life. So he sort of gave credence to this notion of spontaneous generation. So what the heck's going on here? Well, what he did not realize was the fact that when you boil a bacterial suspension like chicken broth, chicken broth, that there are some cells that can withstand the boiling point of water, which of course is 100 degrees Celsius or 212 Fahrenheit. He didn't realize that, nobody realized that, but that was the source of the cells that he saw in that container several days later. It wasn't due to some life force coming from the air. It was due to the fact that there were resistant bacteria that could withstand the boiling. Yeah. Well, an individual that did put spontaneous generation to rest once and for all is a French microbiologist by the name of Louis Pasteur. And uh, hopefully you know or have heard of his name before. You, you certainly have heard of pasteurization, which is named after Louis Pasteur. Well, Pasteur um, had a multitude of contributions to science, not the least of which is, again, putting to rest the notion of spontaneous generation that we'll talk about in just a moment. But he also saved the French wine industry, which was really holding up the economy in France at the time. And when the wine was going bad, the, the economy of France was crashing and it, it had major potential implications. Uh, as, you, as you might imagine, if your whole economy starts to crash, it's gonna have societal effects. Well, he saved the French wine industry uh, as well as uh, contributed to our knowledge of uh, germ theory of disease and so forth that we'll talk about a little bit later. But with respect to spontaneous generation, Pasteur developed these very interesting glass apparati called swan necked flasks. And you can see that, that these flasks, which are open to the air, it's these little um, extensions of the neck are, are open at their tips. What he did was he took a microbial suspension, added it into these various flasks, and then attached various shaped necks. Then he heated them up and he allowed those flasks to sit there for several days. On one group of flasks, which is not shown here, he took and he broke the, the, the neck of the flask right where I'm showing you with the arrow. He broke it there. And the other ones, he just left open, like you see here. What he discovered was the fact that the, the uh, flask that he broke here at the top eventually had growth in the liquid down below. While those that were open here did not have any growth inside. Now, if you had agreed with this notion of a life force in the air, like Needham had talked about, then you should get growth in all of the flasks because they're open to the air, right? But he didn't. The only growth he got in the flask was the one that was broke right here. So what's the difference between that particular group of flasks that had been broken versus those that were not and extended in the manner shown? Well, the difference lies in the fact that the broken flask up here, air and dust and microorganisms could fall into the broth, into that sterile broth, and that would in turn support growth. In all of these other flasks, Let's take a look at this one in particular. How far would the bacteria fall if it fell into the opening? Well, they could, they could get right to about here. They wouldn't get inside and eventually cause the solution to turn cloudy. So just due to the fact that they can't get beyond the lowest point was the reason. And it's quite interesting, if you look today, if you go to the Pasteur Institute in, in France, you can still see some of these swan neck flasks and their sterile broths 
Now they've been sealed here, but uh, they still are in existence, you know, some, you know, 150 years later, pretty amazing. So Pasteur put to rest once and for all this notion of abiogenesis, life coming from non-life. He proved that life comes from life. Life can only arise from other living organisms. So back to the scientific method for a few moments. We talked a little bit about the hypothesis, the development of an experiment to test it, the acquisition of results, the revisiting of the hypothesis based upon the analysis of those results. Again, this is a process that all scientists around the world utilize, even today. And this ability to have your work published and, and peer reviewed and repeated by other investigators studying that same problem just adds more and more evidence to the pile of information, if you will, about that particular topic. Now, if the hypothesis made is supported by this growing body of evidence, all these papers that have been um, written and all these experiments that have been done over the, the years, eventually we develop what is referred to as a theory. So the germ theory of disease is mentioned here, this notion that infectious diseases arise from infectious microorganisms. So it's sort of a level above, a big level above the hypothesis. A scientific theory is based upon many, 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 many years of data. You can even talk about a step above a theory referred to as a law or principle. And I won't get into a lot of detail about this, but if you've ever studied biology, you've heard of the, the law of independent assortment or the law of segregation this applies to Mendelian genetics. And again, I'm not going to get into the details of that, but it is just an additional level of confidence that is agreed upon by scientists world, worldwide. Um, that's not to say you can't tweak a law, you can't tweak a theory. You, you can, but this is, it has, it has risen to a, a level of pretty significant stature. Um, your book talks a little bit about the scientific method as it applies to the work of Dr. Uh, Edward Jenner and his, his uh, investigation uh, of smallpox and cowpox. I'm going to simply ask you to look over these next two slides and kind of work your way through that process of the scientific method and again an appreciation of the contributions that Dr. Jenner made, you know, back in the what, 17, 1800s? Pretty amazing. This is a long time ago, but he was able to discover a relationship between these two. Um, particular infections. So I'm not going to lecture on that. I think you can read that over pretty well and uh, understand what the book's talking about there. Some additional individuals in our, our historical overview of microbiology include John Tyndall and Ferdinand Cohn. And what these guys sort of uh, were able to discover uh, is the fact that there are some microorganisms that appear to be very resistant to heat especially. Now we talked just a few moments ago with respect to the Needham experiment. He did not realize that there were some bacteria that can withstand the boiling point of water. Tyndall and Cohn came to realize that there were quite a few different resistant forms of different bacteria that could survive. And Cohn was even able to hypothesize the formation of structures referred to as endospores, which we'll take a look at in just a few minutes. And these are resistant forms of bacteria that um, sort of go into this hibernation state, if you will, to ride out times when there isn't adequate nutrients, for example, available to the bacteria. And then when conditions improve, which may be thousands of years later, these endospores will germinate, that's the term they use, like a seed, germinates, only this is an endospore, the endospore will germinate into what's called a vegetative cell, 
So when we talk about bacteria and we look at bacteria in lab, we're looking at the vegetative state of the cell. It's kind of a funny word, vegetative. So those are the cells that are growing on your skin, in your gut, in the air we breathe, those are vegetative cells. When certain types of bacteria are subjected to diminished nutrients, increased temperature, um, UV radiation, there's a whole host of environmental factors that can induce the formation of endospores from the vegetative state. Okay, and as I said a moment ago, those endospores will sit there in this desiccated resistant form. They, they don't divide like vegetative cells do, they just sit there and they, they hope secretly that conditions improve. And if they do, they germinate into vegetative cells, which can then metabolize, reproduce, and do what bacteria do. When we talk about sterility, of course, we're talking about the absence of any life form, whether it's vegetative cells or endospores or even prions, which we'll talk a little bit about later, which are infectious proteins. They're not even cells. They're organic molecules, uh, misshapen proteins called prions. If you can eliminate endospores, vegetative cells, prions, viruses, which actually aren't even alive, but they're infectious agents. If you can, if you can eliminate those, uh, then we have what is referred to as a sterile field. And we'll talk more about sterility and how that's uh, acquired or maintained uh, this semester. I'll take you into the prep room and you'll see our autoclave, which our lab tech, Deb Fornis, uses to sterilize uh, media for us to use. Um, this is a, a video that I'm going to, again, ask you to watch. It's about two or three minutes long. Um, just to get a flavor for what endospore formation is sort of like, don't get caught up in all of the details. We'll talk more about endospores coming up, um, I think, in chapter four. So that'll be coming up in a couple of weeks. And we'll probably watch this video again, actually. But just take a moment. Sit back, watch it. Don't worry about taking any notes. Just get an idea of what this process involves. Additional individuals um, here listed helped us understand and develop what is called a septic technique. A septic technique, again, we'll talk more about later, is um, the process whereby we try to eliminate contamination. You're going to develop good aseptic technique in lab as you transfer bacteria from a broth to a slant or from a plate to a broth or whatever it may be. Um, you're going to wipe down your tabletop before and after lab. That's part of aseptic technique. It's trying to remove any bacteria that might be potential contaminants uh, or sources of contamination in our cultures. Sepsis is not good. Sepsis, if you're a doctor or a nurse, Something that's gone septic means you have an infection going on. You have invasion of bacteria or microorganisms and it's causing a problem. So we want to avoid sepsis. A means without. So without sepsis, these are techniques again to try to eliminate or prevent infection. Um, these three individuals, all of which actually are physicians, uh, had major roles to play in helping us better understand the role of microorganisms uh, in terms of, of causing infection, and also what was done in the early days to try to mitigate infection, especially in the hospital setting. And I will tell you from the get-go that these individuals that lived back in the 1800s met with a lot of resistance in trying to implement these observations and um, uh, steps that, that they developed to try to reduce infection rates. And you might say, well, why would you want to oppose that? Well, long story short, but um, change is slow to come sometimes in medicine and in other branches of life, I guess. We're all kind of stubborn. We like to do the things we like to do. We're not open to ideas oftentimes. Um, even though it might help save lives, sometimes 
good things don't often get uh, implemented in a in a institutional sort of way, and that's what certainly Holmes and Semmelweis discovered, even Lister as well, um, as they attempted to implement uh, findings that they knew could help patients, could reduce infection rates. It took a long time to convince um, folks to do these sorts of things. So again, um, I think rather than lecture on each of these, I would simply ask that you be aware of their contributions and that you take some time and you watch the two YouTube videos, one on Semmelweis and one on Lister. I think you're gonna find that to be very fascinating. It's very, very interesting and, uh, and really important stuff. And as nursing students, um, you can appreciate the roles that these folks played in helping to reduce infection rates and deaths. Back to a friend Louis Pasteur for just a moment and to introduce a, a German bacteriologist by the name of Robert Koch. These two fellows um, are often credited with the development of what is referred to as the germ theory of disease. And we talked a little bit about theory just a moment ago. So the germ theory of disease, again, basically says that disease caused by germs, i.e. bacteria, we could probably lump into their viruses and prions too, and maybe even some other sorts of eukaryotic cells that we'll talk about later. Um, but most of the time we think bacteria, that these infections, again, did not come about as a result of emergence from non-life. They did not come about as a result of having no money. They did not come a as a result of being a bad person <laughs> or by um, sins that you committed in life. I mean, it's bizarre, but a lot of people thought that many hundreds of years ago. And so Pasteur and Koch and others too um, helped us understand that bacteria, for example, viruses, microorganisms that were infectious were the contributing factors to many types of disease. So we discussed again the role of Pasteur a little bit earlier in terms of uh, disproving spontaneous generation. He again also saved the French wine industry as I talked about because the wine was going bad. It was fermenting into uh, acetic acid. It was basically turning into vinegar. The, the economy was crashing. He was able to figure out what was going on and he saved, saved the country basically. And uh, another important contribution of Pasteur, as we said earlier, is this process of pasteurization, this mechanism basically of, of heating a liquid. And there's different kinds of pasteurization we'll talk about later coming up in a couple more months. Uh, but basically, you think of milk, for example, that milk that comes out of the bulk tank at the farmer's milk parlor and then taken to the dairy, that's heated, right? It's heated to reduce the microbial load before it's bottled and sent to Tops or Wegmans or Reeds or wherever you're shopping. But we know when we get that bottle of milk, it has a date stamped on it. If we go much beyond that due date or that expiration date, really, really what it is, that the milk's going to go bad. So pasteurization does not sterilize the milk. It simply reduces the microbial load so that it can be maintained for a longer period of time. We, re we refrigerate it to help that process continue. If we leave milk out at room temperature, open to the outside, for example, it's going to go bad faster. Um, so the, the refrigeration also helps, but pasteurization is basically the heating of the solution to a certain temperature for a certain time frame to lengthen its shelf life, basically. And that can be done not only to milk, but vaccines can be pasteurized. Different kinds of liquids that you drink um, are also pasteurized too. Robert Koch, our German bacteriologist, is here working with a uh, colleague in his laboratory. Again, this is back in the late 1800s, so one of the first uh, photographs here. And notice that he's looking at, through a microscope, that resembles something that you and I might be using or will be using soon in lab. Um, this appears to have just a single course adjustment. And uh, you really can't see here, but there's probably several different objectives, maybe two or three objectives that he is able to utilize. Uh, and, and probably able to get up to magnifications uh, close to a thousand times the actual size, which is plenty to see bacteria. Uh, 
So Koch, again, cultured lots of bacteria uh, in his laboratory. He was able to develop what is referred to as pure culture techniques, which means growing bacteria um, in such a way that you maintain the same species. So if he started, for example, with Escherichia coli or E. coli, as you know it, if he started culturing that in a plate, he could take that, aseptically transfer it to another plate, sterile plate, and get it to grow. And then aseptically transfer that into another sterile plate, get it to grow. And every time he examined those plates, he had nothing but E. coli in them. There was no other additional contamination. And, and that's a result of good aseptic technique. But when you grow something in pure culture, it's basically got just the one species growing there. It's not mixed. Um, he also did a lot of work, as it mentions here, on anthrax and tuberculosis and cholera, very uh, communicable diseases. Um, what he's probably most famous for is his formation of what is referred to as Koch's postulates. So let's talk a little bit about these, these rules, these postulates that Koch developed that are still utilized today in microbiology lab. And I'm pulling this information from chapter 13, so you can flip to page 439 and, and read all about this, but I'm gonna basically capture the essence of it here in the next few slides. So what Koch was able to do was to set into motion a series of steps, which if adhered to, he could then claim that this particular microorganism was the causative agent of this particular disease. Okay, so he's connecting a particular bacterium with a particular infection. And in order for you to say, or Koch to say, that this particular microorganism causes this particular disease involves following the following steps. The first thing he had to do was he had to find evidence of that particular microorganism in every case of that particular disease. So he would go out, he would identify a particular infection, uh, its symptoms, whatever the case may be. He would extract a sample from those patients, bring them back to the laboratory. He isolated the microorganism because when you get a sample from a patient, whether it's a sputum sample or a fecal sample or whatever it might be, it's not a pure culture. It's a mixed culture. It could be several dozen bacteria in there, right? You've got to isolate those from one another. And so he was able to do that. And he was able to grow each of those in pure culture, which you know means just that one species. So he was able to isolate and grow in pure culture those various microorganisms. Then what he did was he took those isolated pure cultures and he separately introduce those into live specimens. Now he didn't use people because that would be a little unethical. He used mice. So he would inoculate the, the healthy mouse with these various isolated bacteria that he was able to, to, to grow from the patients. And then he would see what happened to the mouse. And of course, if it was a virulent microorganism, the mouse would die. He would then get that specimen from the dead mouse and be able to grow it in pure culture once again after isolating it from potentially other microorganisms. So these different steps, if you will, these four postulates basically allow us to say that a particular microorganism is the causative agent of a particular disease. Koch's postulates. As we begin to get close to the end of chapter two, or chapter one rather, um, we wanna talk a little bit about taxonomy. We're shifting gears pretty much here uh, to another realm of science. Taxonomy is the process that scientists use when they try to classify and organize and name organisms. This was established way, way back in the early 1700s by this individual, Lene, I, I think he was French, but don't quote me, I'm not sure. And he began to name organisms. Well, what did he base his naming 
of them on? Well, he tried to look at common characteristics. And oftentimes he had nothing to go on other than physical traits or characteristics, right? So he was able to group all the animals together because they had wings. He was able to group the fish together because they all had fins. They all, he was able to group the plants together because they all had green leaves. You know, it sounds kind of rudimentary and simplistic, but, but basically that's what he did. He looked at physical attributes and that was one of the ways that made it easier for him to at least in general pr provide these initial classification uh, schematics. So the process of looking at taxonomic uh, organization involves different levels of classification. And if you've ever taken um, a botany class or a zoology class, uh, you've certainly heard of, of these terms. I suspect many of you have not done that, but what we have here uh, are what, two, four, six, eight different terms. And we're going from the most broad level of classification called the domain down to a very specific taxon, which is the species level. We're going to describe some examples of this in just a moment. But domain, kingdom, phylum or division, class, order, family, genus, species. That's the sequence. As we go down, we get more and more and more and more and more and more specific. And, or another way of saying that is as we go up the taxonomic classification, we get into more and more broader attributes to those organisms. Okay, here's that sample uh, of taxonomy I was referring to a moment ago. On the left-hand side, we're looking at organisms, all of which are eukaryotic, meaning they are composed of cells that have a membrane-bound nucleus and many other membranous organelles. And on the right-hand side, here are uh, our organisms, look like unicellular uh, protozoa, single-celled protozoa like we might see in lab soon. So they both fall within the same domain. And we'll describe the three domains in just a moment, but this is the one that you fall into as well, the domain eukarya. So eukarya, that domain contains all of the eukaryotic cells, all the organisms made up of eukaryotic cells. That would include you. So there you are. But in this particular example, in the first kingdom that we're looking at of eukarya, called the kingdom animalia, which of course means animal kingdom, we're not the only animals. We share the globe with all of these other structures or organisms, I should say. Now, maybe you know what a lemur is, you know what a dog looks like, you know what an ape is, gorilla, but would sea star or starfish fall within that category in your mind? Well, maybe, it's an animal. I bet you've never heard of this thing called a sea squirt, um, but nonetheless, it is an animal. Looks like a sponge. I've seen them in, in Panama when I'm snorkeling quite a bit, quite a few times. They're actually pretty cool, come in different colors. As we go down in the taxonomic hierarchy, we next encounter the term phylum, and then of course, class, order, family, genus, species. Look what happens as we jump from kingdom animalia to phylum chordata. We lose the starfish or sea star because the sea star falls in a different phylum than chordata does. It doesn't have, and I'm not gonna get into a lot of details here, but chordates have uh, several different um, embryonic and developmental structures. Sea stars don't have that. They're, they're, they don't form in the same way that these five organisms develop embryologically. So we, we, we take them out of this phylum. They go into a different phylum called echinodermata. We, as we go down to the class mammalia, look what we lose. We lose the, the sea squirts. They fall into a different phylum. They're, or a different class, I'm sorry. They're, they're tunicates. They're not mammals. The human, the lemur, the dog, and the gorilla, we are all mammals. 
meaning mammary gland forming milk. As we go down, primates. Well, we lose the dog, right? A dog is not a primate. Falls into a different order. Phylum, or I'm uh, sorry, uh, family hom hominoidae. There goes the lemur. Lemurs are not in this family. The gorillas are and humans are. And then finally, down to the more specific, two taxa, genus, homo, species, sapiens. That is our name, our scientific Latin name, right? Homo sapiens, you've all heard of that. So again, try to get an appreciation of what this taxonomic uh, nomenclature sort of involves. The fact that we have a domain, then a kingdom, then a phylum, then a class, then an order, then a family, then a genus, then a species. And as we go down, we become more and more and more and more specific in terms of the attributes that define that particular taxonomic level. You don't have to memorize this, just understand the basic premise of how it works. So getting back to how organisms are named. Well, we just said a moment ago, our name is Homo sapiens. Homo is our genus, sapiens is our species. So we typically use this binomial nomenclature, this two name sequence, they're Latin names, to describe our scientific name. Homo sapiens for humans. Homo again is the genus. And notice that the first letter of the genus is always capitalized with the rest of the letters being lowercase. So we can go back to this previous slide and there you see capital H for Homo, the rest of the letters here lowercase. Species, the second of the two terms are all in lowercase letters as evidenced again by our example. When a scientific name is written in a document, the genus and species terms have to either be italicized or if you can't italicize them, they should be underlined. And when you go to turn in your lab report exercises, and you refer to a bacterium, I want you to get into the habit of underlining the genus and the species. It's just a good habit to get into. And I'm going to remind you about probably a million times about this, but let's get it cemented in your brain right now. Whenever you talk about or write the genus and species of any organism, either italicize it, if you're you know, writing the report of the unknown or you're writing a research paper or whatever, um, or if you can't italicize, then underline. Making sure again, the first letter of the, of the genus is capitalized, rest lowercase, and the species, <clears throat> all lowercase letters. What you're looking at here is a particular type of bacteria. You've heard of staph before, that's the sort of the slang short name for the, for the genus, but there's different types of staph. This happens to be aureus, which we're gonna be working with quite a bit coming up in lab this semester. It's kind of fun and interesting to look at how certain organisms have been named over the years. Um, when somebody discovers a new organism, um, if you're a scientist, you have naming rights, which is kind of interesting. So I've just picked out some fun, kind of silly, but yet you find them in the literature. If you look, here's jelly bean. Here's bah humbug. Here's, here's looking at you. Yeah. These are actual organisms, and these are the actual documented, scientific, scientifically accepted Latin terms to describe the genus and the species. We should have some appreciation and understanding of evolution and the fact that all organisms evolve as time goes on, they change as populations are subjected to, to, to alterations in their environment. I'm not gonna get into a lot of discussion of evolution, that's a basic principles of bio topic. But we've already established the fact that life arises from life, right? So when we look at organisms that are on earth today, including us, that we originated from pre-existing species. 
everything that's living today didn't come on the scene miraculously in the in their in their present form they have a history of pre-existing species so evolution of course describes that mechanism or that process that gives rise to changes in populations that can in turn give rise to different species technically when we talk about two organisms of the same species they have the ability to interbreed um, if you cannot interbreed, then you are of different species for the most part. This process is ongoing and generally leads to greater complexity in that particular group of organisms. That's not to say that prokaryotic cells, bacteria, are not complex. They, they are in the sense of they do some pretty amazing biochemistry. But if you compare a prokaryotic cell like a bacterium to a eukaryotic cell, like say one of your white blood cells, the eukaryotic cell, as you know from earlier in the chapter, evolved from the prokaryote and has all these organelles that do an amazing array of things that the prokaryote cannot do. So again, the process of evolution generally leads to more uh, complexity within the cell and within the organism, which is of course made up of you know, tons of different kinds of cells. This is our last slide um, and basically looks at this shrub of life, not so much a tree of life as it is a, a shrub, um, with this idea that here we have the three major domains, taxonomic domains. We talked about eukarya a little bit earlier, but here are the other two, the domain archaea and the domain bacteria. We will be spending time in upcoming chapters getting into more details of these three domains and representatives in these domains as it applies to microbiology. Um, just as a takeaway, these first two domains, the bacteria and archaea, are both composed of prokaryotic cells. But the, gr the groups of cells here in the domain archaea, while they are prokaryotic, as you'll see later, they do share some very interesting similarities with eukaryotic cells that make them very different from bacteria. Okay, they're still prokaryotes, just like bacteria are prokaryotes, but they're unique enough in many different ways that scientists have, have, have put them in their own domain, the archaea. They're really cool and interesting cells. So if we were to trace back, if we could, in time, the present day bacteria here in this domain or the archaea in this domain or the eukaryotic cells in the domain of eukarya, they do share common lineage in terms of having some ancestral life cell line, I should say, from which these branches eventually then deviated, sort of like the, the trunk of the tree eventually forms into various you know, branches for that sort of analogy. And so you can kind of see here again where, where the green leading to the archaea and the red leading to the eukarya, they're, they're kind of closer together, aren't they? Okay, and that's because again, they, they, they're, they're, they're different, but they have some interesting properties that are kind of common to both. Um, so know these three domain names, know basically what they contain, and um, we will be talking in great detail about um, them coming up in the next couple of weeks. Okay, that ends chapter one, the main themes of microbiology.